We're going to be talking about the globe-trotting journey uh, through the world of beer. Uh, and I should note, too, that this is it's the subtitle of The Atlas of Beer, which is a book that uh, Nancy and I wrote for National Geographic. So, all right. This is probably the number one question we get. Wait, <clears throat> what do you do? So we call ourselves professional beer drinkers because we technically get paid to drink beer. Um, and, and not only that, but we technically get paid to travel the world to drink beer and talk to people about beer and ask them their stories. And it's a pretty good gig. Um, so uh, we've been all over the world and as life has it, you know, here I am back home, right? talking about this. <clears throat> a bit of background, in 2010, Nancy and I published a book on environmental management. So it's nothing to do with beer at all. So both, both Nancy and I are environmental geographers. <clears throat> and 2012, we're in New York City, and we're at this big geography conference, and we said, you know what? I bet you our publisher of this book is here. We should go see the editor and just say hi. So we're in the Marriott, we go to the uh, exhibition hall where all the uh, vendors have their stalls set up, and he sees us approaching the stall, and he comes running out with this book, and he goes, Mark, Nancy, i got to show you this book. It's selling like hotcakes. <clears throat> this book here sold about 2,500 copies. So for an academic book, <laughs> for an academic book, that's really good, 2,500 copies. <clears throat> He comes running out with a book and he flips it over and it's called The Geography of Wine. He goes, we can't keep this in, in uh, print. As soon as we print it, people are buying it. So The Geography of Wine sold about 20,000 copies. And that was an academic text as well. And that's phenomenal. 20,000 copies is almost unheard of. <clears throat> and Nancy said, when are you doing beer? And he said, well, what are you guys doing for dinner? And we said nothing. And literally, we sat down and on a cocktail napkin, we sketched out the table of contents. And two years later, this book came out. So how many copies did the Geography of Wine sell? All right. So this sold 56,000 copies. All right. So yes. <laughs> All right. Which, again, is unheard of in terms of academic textbooks. <clears throat> Uh, National Geographic got a copy of the book and invited Nancy and I to go up to Washington, D.C. and basically make a sales pitch. You know, if you were to write a, a non-academic version of this book, what would it look like? So we went up to Washington, D.C. and it was very much like this. We set up our PowerPoint, we're getting ready to give a talk, and uh, this girl walks in and she has these uh, brown paper bags, and in the brown paper bags, she has beer. She goes, we want to make sure you guys are legit. <clears throat> so she pulls out the first beer and she goes, tell me about this. How many of you guys have seen Slumdog Millionaire? So you know, you know how the kid knows all the answers just because of things that have happened you know, in his life? Well, this was our Slumdog Millionaire moment. So the first beer she pulls out is a local beer from Washington, DC. And the night before, I was at a bar I was drinking this beer. I was <clears throat> talking to the bartender about it. He was telling me all about the beer, all about the brewery. And I just stood there and regurgitated it like I, I knew what I was talking about. <laughs> Pulls out the next one, and it was a, uh, a beer from Bavaria. It was a wheat beer. And it just happened to be Nancy's favorite beer of all time. So she just jumped in and just told him everything about this beer. And the last beer was a beer that we had tasted about a week before. And we had never tried it before. And one of the things that Nancy and I do, being beer geeks, is we we talk about the flavors. We talk about, well, how do we think geography affects the way this beer is tasting? And it happened to be that beer. So we nailed all three. We went ahead and we gave the talk. This was in February. In May, they offered us a contract. And by the end of December, we had signed the contract and reached an agreement. And we spent two years traveling the world. And this is the result of traveling the world uh, and talking to people about beer. So it's been, a, it was, it's been a lot of fun. We're still actually traveling. 
and we, we have a, another academic textbook called The Geography of Beer, Volume 2, coming out uh, hopefully by the end of this year. So we'll see. Okay, a couple of things then. Um, I don't want to get technical because I want to talk to you guys about the history and the geography behind the beers that we're going to be drinking. But I will use some terms that I'm going to throw out there, assuming that everyone knows. And I'll just go over them briefly. When I talk about the ingredients of beer, so there's only four ingredients in beer, right? So we've got barley, water, hops, and yeast. <clears throat> so four basic ingredients. Yet from those four ingredients, look at all the beers in front of you. You can come up with hundreds of different beer styles. So what accounts for that? That's one of the questions that we are asking. How, how can you make so many different styles of beer with only these four ingredients? Right. And the answer is geography. So <clears throat> the yeast that you use in a particular location is going to be different than the yeast you're going to find in other locations. The barley is going to taste different. The water is going to have different water quality. The hops are going to be different. There's a lot of, and, and I'm stealing this term from the wine community, but the terroir that you find in beer right, is evident in these four ingredients in beer. Now you can add things to beer like wheat or oats or fruit. Those are called adjuncts. So if I use the term adjunct, it, it's an ingredient we've added to beer that's not one of these basic four. We divide beer into two basic types. Uh, we've got ales. I'm sure you guys have heard of ales. And we've got lagers. And, and the difference is basically the yeast that is used. So we've got an ale yeast. And this is a broad category. And this is yeast that when you throw it into the wort or the sugary water, it stays on top and the fermentation occurs on top. Versus the lager yeast, you throw that in and it sinks to the bottom and the fermentation occurs in the bottom. <clears throat> and then from there we've got beer styles. So for example, a beer style that everyone's heard about is an IPA. Right? So an India Pale Ale is a beer style. In fact, we've got an American uh, IPA, we've got an English IPA, and now we've got an Argenta IPA from uh, South America. Pacific IPA from New Zealand. So these different beer styles are starting to emerge. So they're all IPAs, but they're all ales. So India Pale Ale, for example. And with this whole craft beer revolution, most of the beers being brewed today are ales. And increasingly, what you're finding today, more and more breweries are trying to brew lagers. Lagers are very hard to to brew, to brew well, because you can't hide your mistakes in a lager as well as you can hide your mistakes uh, in an ale. <clears throat> so I am a teacher, so let's begin with a quiz then. All right, top five countries for beer consumption. So yeah, this is beer consumption per capita. Germany. Australia. Australia? Who said Australia? No. Ireland, no. So, <clears throat> someone said the first one. So, first one is Czechia. All right. So this is the new official name of the Czech Republic. All right. So 175 liters per person. <laughs> no, no, no. In one sitting. So, no. <laughs> this is the annual consumption. That's a lot of beer. So. Uh, someone also mentioned, uh, actually I don't know if they mentioned this, but Austria. But notice there's a pretty big gap between the two. <laughs> so, uh, someone did mention Germany. Uh, nobody mentioned this one and no one will mention this one. Uh, it's not in um, Europe, but it's actually in Africa. Okay. And then Poland. All right. So Canada is way, way down on that list. So, sorry? You're helping? Thank you. So, when did that survey occur? Is that like recently? This is 2016. And this here is also 2016. So this is beer production. Who's producing beer? So what are the top five countries? <laughs> 
So the US. the US is up there, yeah. Japan. Japan, no. No. The number one country by far, by far, all right, is China. Uh, and they have this one particular beer, it's called Snow, and it's uh, basically, it, it's their version of Budweiser, so it's a pale lager. Uh, you can only get it there. Uh, and that particular beer sells more than any other brand of beer. So, all right, so someone else said US. All right, and then we've got uh, Brazil of all places, so. Followed by Mexico and then Germany. The interesting thing about Mexico is you don't really think people in Mexico are big beer drinkers, do you? Mexico exports more beer than any other country. So roughly 50% of the beer brewed in Mexico is shipped overseas. And the number one destination is the US. Yeah. Well. All right, any questions? You feeling a little bit loose and, and ready to dive into it? Can you guys hear me in the back okay? Uh, with respect to Mexico? Yeah, well, with China, I'm thinking like they don't have a lot of they Yeah, of so in China, they're producing their own barley, they're producing their own hops, they've got water, and then they can import yeast or produce their own yeast there. So. What would be the history of the beer conception in China? So, uh, archaeologists have found that the oldest brewery, uh, we used to think. Traditionally, it was in Mesopotamia, but 7,000 years ago, it's actually dated back to 9,000 years ago in China, where they found evidence. Uh, and this is in shards of pottery, where they've, they've done analysis of what was in the pottery. And they found, oh, this is a brewery. So they've been at it for a while. <laughs> yeah. OK, so we're going to look at some styles. And the first style here we're going to look at uh, is a Pilsner. How many of you guys have had a Pilsner? Probably most of you. So I know Paul and I growing up would uh, ask our dad, could we have a sip of beer? And my dad would only drink Pilsner. So Molson Canadian, Labatt's Blue, for example, those are, those are uh, good examples of Pilsners. <clears throat> so we need to start in Europe here. And Pilsners originated uh, in the Bohemian region here in the Czech Republic, or Czechia, and right next door in Germany and Bavaria. So these are the two places where Pilsner um, first got its roots and from there spread to the rest of the world. But before we get into the nuts and bolts of Pilsner, we need to back up in time. All right. We need to back up to about uh, 1500 BC, or sorry, 1500 AD. So Christopher Columbus had just made it over, discovered the New World. So we're starting to see the advent of European ships coming over to the New World, so both North America and South America. They're getting supplies, they're getting whatever resources they have there, and they're taking them back. And one of the things that the well-to-do in Europe liked was a particular fruit. This is called a gull fruit. I don't know if you guys have ever had a gull fruit. <clears throat> So it was well liked uh, by the nobility in Europe. And the gall fruit comes uh, from the Patagonia region. So this is southern Argentina and Chile today. So this is where the fruit comes. <clears throat> the sailors would come, they would load their fruit up on their ships, and they would make the journey back uh, to Europe. And then from there, the uh, fruits would be distributed. I bring this up because on the skin of the fruit, there happened to be something living on the, on the skin. And of course, back then, people had no idea. Uh, and what was living, the organism that was living on the skin of the fruit was actually a yeast strain. So, so this yeast strain inadvertently hitched a ride on ships going to Europe. When the yeast arrived in Europe, it actually started interacting with the yeast that was already there in Europe. And yeast is everywhere. There's yeast all over the place in this building right now. 
So you could probably take Nick's beard, find some yeast in there, and brew beer. Seriously. That's been done. Yeah. <laughs> so it was rogue. So they have uh, beard beer. Yeah. It's not very good. No. But. <laughs> wow. So the yeast that was in Europe to begin with was ale yeast. So they were making, the beers that they were making were ales. This yeast that came from Southern South America went to Europe, hybridized with the ale yeast, allowed brewers to produce another type of beer. They didn't realize it at the time. Of course, they had no idea what yeast was. <clears throat> but some monks in Bavaria were finding that they were starting to brew beer. And when they brew beer, they leave it open to the elements. And whatever yeast happens to be in the air falls in. They would start to store this beer in caves in the Alps. This new yeast was a lager yeast. So now we start to see lagers becoming more popular. And if you speak German, you know that the term lager means? To condition and hold All right. It means to store. All right. So they're storing their beer in caves in the Alps, where it's cool and it stores longer. And what we see happening then is when the beer is ready to be consumed, it tends to be lighter in color, it's crisper, the carbonation is a lot higher. So I'm describing the traits of, uh, of a pilsner. So, so we'll go back to Bohemia. <clears throat> so this is in the 1840s and the townspeople in a town called Pilsen, and this is in uh, Chechia, were fed up with the beer they had. So they went to, the, ta they went to the, the city fathers and said, you gotta fix this. We're not happy with this beer. So they were being inundated with low quality beer from Germany, from Austria, from Poland. So what the city fathers did, and this is really a responsible government, Dennis Walsh. <coughs> <laughs> is that they, they went out and they hired a brewer from Bavaria, so next door in Germany. And his name is Joseph Grohl. And he came over to Pilsen and he worked in secret and he labored. And on the day his beer was ready, he called the townsfolks to the, to the town square. He said, all right, I've got a beer. You've never seen anything like this uh, and I want you to try it. <clears throat> and they started pouring the beer and the beer was that light color, that typical color of a Pilsner. People were going, what the heck's this? Because they're used to dark beer, a beer that was warm, a beer that was relatively flat compared to a Pilsner. And they, they didn't know what to make of it. Well, they drank it, and they fell in love with it. And they go, this is like the best thing they've ever had. From there, Pilsner took off, not only in Bohemia, but also in Bavaria, and quickly the rest of the world. And there are a couple places where Pilsners didn't take root. So England and Belgium, for example, you don't find a lot of Pilsners there. But today, Pilsner is the number one selling type of or style of beer. So roughly 80% of all the beer in the world that's sold happens to be a Pilsner. So you can go to Pilsen, and you can go to that brewery where the first uh, Pilsner was created, and you can actually drink beer right out of one of the kegs that they have there, and these are wooden kegs. And I'm sure everyone has had this beer. So the brewery was called Pilsner or Quell. So Pilsner is German meaning from or of Pilsen, and or Quell means from the source. So Pilsner or Quell means from the source of Pilsen. Now, I also mentioned that there's a German version of it. So Germans can't call it a Pilsner because it's not from, if you're in Germany, Pilsen is in the Czech Republic or Czechia, so they can't call it a Pilsner. So if you drink a Pilsner that's called a Pils, this is the German style of a Pilsner. So Pilsner is the Czech or Czechia style, Pils is the German or Bavarian style. So we're going to try um, a Pilsner, and I'm sure many of you have had it. Uh, and this is from Phillips Brewing in Victoria. 
So technically this next one, Radler, is not a beer style. It's actually a beer cocktail. But I think the story behind it's really interesting and there's geography and history behind it. So um, we are going to learn about the Radler and then uh, I think Mitch is gonna, are you gonna pour it ahead of time or? I can pour it right now if you want me to. Okay. So. <clears throat> So we're going to go back to Germany, and now this is in the 1920s. So Germany is recovering from the war. And one of the things that the government is doing is it's promoting cycling, not only as recreation, but as a mode of transportation. So cycling becomes really popular uh, in Germany, and in particular, southern Germany, so in Bavaria, uh, and especially in the biggest town in Bavaria, and that's Munich. So there was an enterprising innkeeper who lived just south of Munich, and he said, well, how can, I get, how can I get people to come down? It was about 12 miles. How can I get people to travel the 12 miles from Munich down to my tavern? And he decided, well, I'm going to build a, uh, a bike path. So he built a bike path 12 miles long, and uh, this is what his place looks like today. When you look at photos of it uh, in the past, it didn't look all that different. But as the story goes, one particular afternoon it was warm. There were a lot of cyclists out and they were going uh, on the bike path and 30,000 cyclists showed up at this guy's uh, tavern. And he's pouring the beer and he's quickly doing the math in his head and he's thinking, I don't have enough beer to serve everyone. But in his cellar, he had lemon soda that wasn't selling. <clears throat> so he took it upon himself to actually mix half beer, half lemon soda, and started selling that. And the cyclists were getting upset, and they go, well, what is this crap? <clears throat> and he said, I don't want you to get drunk and then have to worry about getting home, so this is what I'm doing. <clears throat> <laughs> and, the, and the cyclists bought the story. Not only did they buy the story, but they bought the rest of the beer and the rest of the lemon soda. So this, the, uh, it was actually Franz Kugler. He thought, man, I'm onto something. If cyclists really enjoy this, I'm gonna create this new uh, beer cocktail. And he called the cocktail the Radler. And if you know any German, based on my, the last time I asked that, no one in here does, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Radler is German for cyclist, which is why you'll often see a bicycle on the label of a Radler. Now, technically, Radler is a, uh, a lager and lemon soda. Uh, you guys are going to get the Philips Pilsner, which is the lager, and you're going to get grapefruit juice with it. So if it's not lemon soda, we call it a shandy, but the idea is the same thing. So this is going to be, is it 50-50, Mitch? Uh, yeah. So half grapefruit juice, soda, and half of the Pilsner that you just tried. And one of the things, one of the reasons why this is really taking off in popularity is that a lot of brewers are making this particular beer cocktail to target the perhaps the most underrepresented segment of the craft beer uh, market, and that's female drinkers. So, all right, we're going to go to a style here that everyone has had before, uh, and that is a porter or a stout. Do you guys know what the difference is between a porter and a stout? <laughs> Other than Mitch? <laughs> is there a difference? Why we're here, man. Come on. Okay. <laughs> All right. A stout is simply a more robust porter. So the, uh, the alcohol, alcohol content may be higher, the mouthfeel may be a little bit heavier, um, but other than that, all right, it's quite similar. <clears throat> so we're going back to the 17th century. Uh, we're going back to London. So this is where the style originated uh, in London. <clears throat> and we know, of course, that a porter or a stout is dark in color. All right, why is it dark in color? 
because back then they didn't have the technology to um, roast the barley uh, evenly. So when they roasted the barley, it tended to come out somewhat on the burnt side or the dark side. And that darkness then transferred over as the uh, color of the beer. The name porter comes from the people that tended to drink porter. And these were day laborers. So these were people who were carrying stuff or um, people who were involved in, say, a portage. So they were carrying it. Manual laborers, they preferred the porter. So the beer then was given the name porter uh, from the people that worked in manual labor jobs. <coughs> We're going to move ahead a few years, and then this guy comes into play. Anyone recognize him? Any historians? No? All right, this is Peter the Great. So Peter the Great is in the Russian. He visited London and fell in love with Porter, because they didn't have that beer style in, in St. Petersburg at the time. And he asked, is there any way that you can ship this beer right, uh, over to St. Petersburg? So of course, the English agreed. And they started shipping the beer from London over to St. Petersburg. But one of the things that they had to do, because th this journey took a couple of months, <clears throat> was they had to make this porter or this stout a little heavier. So a little, a little higher in alcohol so that it could actually survive the trip. And when it arrived in St. Petersburg, it would still taste the way it was supposed to taste. <clears throat> so they were increasing the alcohol content of the porter, and a new style emerged. And I don't know how many of you guys have heard of a Russian imperial stout. So whenever you see the word imperial, that means it's going to have a higher level of alcohol. So in this case here, uh, Russian imperial stouts is, is a stout that has an alcohol content higher than 7.5%. And typically, Russian imperial stouts will have 8 9%, so a lot more alcohol. From St. Petersburg then, the style made its way into other parts of Europe where it became quite popular. Today, of course, one of the most common uh, stouts you're going to find, and this is a dry Irish stout, is of course Guinness. So you can find Guinness pretty much everywhere in the world. Um, this is obviously, well not obviously, but this is in the storehouse in Dublin. And this here is a porter uh, that we found in Australia. So it's, that particular style of beer is now everywhere uh, in the world. And most people or most places will serve this style in the winter as opposed to the summer. So I'm really glad that Mitch was able to get his hands um, on a stout. It's a stout? Yeah. A stout that we're going to try. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we're going to have a stout from Lighthouse Brewing, which is in Victoria. And one of the things about a stout I just want to mention, I haven't really brought up any tasting notes, is that, you know, before you swallow it, you should be able to taste in your mouth either like a, a coffee or a chocolate or a caramel flavor. Those aren't things that are added to the beer. These are flavors that the malt or the barley picks up as it's being roasted. So depending on how long you roast the barley, it's going to pick up different uh, flavor profiles. So if you are tasting coffee or chocolate or caramel, that's just from the barley. Oh. Anyway, enjoy. We're going to talk about another beer style that's becoming increasingly popular, and that's uh, a sour beer. How many of you guys have been on a tour of a brewery before? So whether it's like... Uh, Iron Road or wherever. So, oops, let me just back up. <clears throat> this is what you see, right? Super clean, you can eat off the floor. Right? So you want to have an environment like this to limit whatever uh, potential uh, infections that may occur. But we're going to go to Belgium, and we're going to go to, uh, this is a river valley here, and this particular area in Belgium, central Belgium, is called Pahotenland, and it's where the Zen River flows. And if you look at the landscape, it's, it's agriculture, right? So there's nothing really remarkable about it. All right. And you can see it from the air, and you can see some places here 
This is the Zen River, and here they've channelized parts of the river. Again, there's not really a lot to it. It's, it's pretty basic. Um, but if we go to the uh, late 1800s, this is Brussels. Brussels hated the river so much that they buried it. So they, they built canals so that the river would not uh, be at the surface, that it would flow under. And the reason why was because people were throwing their garbage and they were polluting in the river, so much so that the river became uh, a health uh, concern. So they decided to bury the river. Today, in Brussels, <clears throat> you can see here's the river here. So it's highly channelized. All right, it's no longer buried. <clears throat> uh, the river's coming back to life. But in this particular river valley, in this particular part of Brussels, we'll zoom into an industrial place. And there's actually a, brewer, a brewery uh, located here. And again, this is like light industry, so you wouldn't necessarily expect to find a brewery here. Uh, but the brewery is uh, right here. And if you go visit the brewery, you can go in and you can see this is the mash tun. It's super old. So this is really old school. The equipment's old. The actual brewery is, is pretty filthy. So they don't do a really good job of, of keeping it clean. <clears throat> One of the things that you want to do as a brewer is you want to minimize the exposure of your wort and your uh, beer to air. And what these guys do is they actually pump the wort. So this is um, the sugary water made from the barley. And they have not added the yeast yet. So this is not, there's no alcohol in here. But they pump it upstairs into something called a cool ship. And it's exposed to the air. And they want it exposed to the air. And you can see there's a beam running across the cool ship here. And if you look closely at it, <clears throat> this is mold. All right. They want this mold to fall off and go into the beer. Uh, they have windows that are open all the way along here. They want the air to come in with yeast, and they want the yeast to fall out of the air and land in the cool ship. And they leave th that wart in the cool ship exposed to the elements for about 18 hours. And then after that, whatever has fallen in starts the fermentation process. They take the beer then, and they move it into barrels. <clears throat> so barrels like this. And if they're lucky, you can see this here. There's an infection going on inside that barrel. <clears throat> this is what they want. All right. So this infection means that the beer is becoming sour. Uh, for those of you uh, who are wondering, this is the uh, Cantillon Brewery in Brussels. So this is perhaps one of the most famous breweries in the world that produce sour beer. All right, the, the bottles that you can get at the Cantillon Brewery, they retail from about 750 to 15 euros for a bomber. So of course, you have you, you got to pay to get over there to get it. Um, uh, but uh, sour beers are becoming uh, increasingly popular with the local beer community. And we are going to try a sour beer. Uh, and this is something that Mitch and I just came up with. Uh, this is a sour beer from Sweden. Uh, and you'll notice that its color is very different than the beers that we've had so far. So it's kind of a, a pinkish purple in color. And that's because of the, uh, Mitch, is it blackberries? Uh, currants and chamomile. Sorry, currants and chamomile. So you might be able to taste a little bit of tea in there. So we're going to talk about two styles that uh, come from Belgium, and perhaps you've tried them before. One's called a double, one's called a triple, or tripel. And if you look back uh, over time, particularly starting in the Middle Ages, which ran from about 500 uh, AD to 1500 AD, uh, it was the church that was in charge of brewing. So the church controlled who could brew, what ingredients you could use, uh, who could sell the beer. And by and large, whoever controlled brewing held the power. So there were times during the Middle Ages where there were scuffles between the church and royalty, where uh, royalty or nobility took over, and they controlled the brewing. And the bulk of the money started going to them. So for the longest time, then, whoever controlled brewing controlled the power. 
So <clears throat> we're going to look at a particular individual, uh, St. Benedict. So this is about 500 AD. So St. Benedict created an order called the Benedictines. And the motto was work and prayer. But one of the things that uh, St. Benedict believed in was that the monks should be self-sufficient. And including in that is the monks should brew their own beer uh, and consume their own beer. Now, you got to keep in mind that back then, people didn't understand why. But if you drank water, you got sick and you died. If you drank beer, you were fine. Right. So people would drink or prefer to have beer over water. And obviously, that's because they weren't aware that there were microbes or germs in the water that would lead to diseases and kill you. And when you made beer, you obviously boiled the water, which killed off uh, a lot of the nasties. <clears throat> so St. Benedict created this order called the Benedictines. And we go forward in time. And over time, the monks you know, got a little more relaxed with the rules. And another order then uh, was an offshoot of the Benedictines. And these were the Cistercians. <clears throat> and they believed basically in what Benedict believed in when he first created the order. So work and pray. We need to work hard. We need to provide for ourselves. <clears throat> so this is a return to the orthodoxy that Benedict created back in 500 uh, AD. Fast forward a couple hundred years. And wouldn't you know it, <clears throat> the monks are starting to get a little more relaxed. And then from the Cistercians, another order sprouted out. And these were the Trappists. So maybe you've heard of Trappist beer before. But these are the monks then that <clears throat> gave us the Trappist ales that, that we see uh, everywhere. So the Trappist order originated in La Trappe, which is in France, here just north of Paris. Now, we're going to fast forward to uh, the time of Napoleon. And Napoleon wasn't very kind to religious orders. <clears throat> he chased out a lot of the Trappist monks. And these monks ended up going to places in neighboring Belgium. So now when you think of Trappist beer, Belgium should automatically come to mind, because this is where six of the Trappist beers that you can find around the world uh, hail from. <clears throat> and there was one brewery in particular, or monastery, <clears throat> And that's West Malle. <clears throat> and they are known for their double. So what used to happen was monasteries would be, uh, imagine like a Motel 6. So travelers would come. They would need a place to rest. The monks would put them up. The monks would serve them food, would serve them beer. But in order to distinguish the beer that the travelers got versus the beers that the monks got, for the travelers, they would put one cross on the keg. So that was meant for travelers. And for the monks, they would put two crosses, or double. So this beer was higher in quality, higher in alcohol. So the travelers got served the, poor, the, the lower quality, while the monks kept the good stuff for themselves. <clears throat> so the West Mali has a double. You notice that it's relatively dark in color. And it's relatively high in alcohol. So the alcohol content ranges from about uh, six and a half to nine percent for a double. <clears throat> There's also another Trappist beer that's dark, and that's a quad, and that ranges from about nine to twelve percent. So it's pretty high in alcohol. <clears throat> um, the double and the quad are relatively similar. I wanted you guys to try uh, the double, but I also wanted you to try the triple. Notice the triple is different in color, so it's a lot lighter than the double here. <clears throat> The triple is about 9 to 10%, so it's got a lot of alcohol in it. But the triple, the first triple was made in 1956. So this is a relatively recent uh, development in the world of Trappist beers. So this dates back uh, to the uh, early to mid 1800s. This is about 100 years later. And this beer here was made specifically by the monks as a way to combat the influence of Pilsner beer coming from the Czech Republic and coming from Germany. The monks were saying, here's a beer that's light in color. It's, got, it's not quite as carbonated, but we want you to drink this instead. And the monks were successful enough in creating this new style, a triple, that uh, 
Pilsners are not very common in Belgium. So we're going to try both of these. Well, we're not going to try a West Molly. We're going to try a um, two BC beers. So one, the double, is from uh, Daggerad in Burnaby, and then Red Collar Triple. Hopefully some of you, or most of you, tried the triple in Red Collar. I see a lot of folks here that I've seen at Red Collar a lot. I'm just wondering if it's, <laughs> just wondering if it's closed tonight. So. <laughs> The last style we're going to look at is the IPA or India Pale Ale. Um, I was mentioning earlier that there probably is not a brewery around that does not make this style. So every brewery is making their own interpretation of this particular style. Uh, and I note here circa 18th century and reinvented in the 20th century. If there's one style that can be uh, attributed to the success of the craft beer revolution, <clears throat> it's this style here. So I'm sure most people have tried uh, an IPA before. So these are some of the, uh, the more popular ones. Maybe you've tried some of these. But like I said, every brewery is coming out with their own interpretation uh, of these styles. So where does the name come from? What we need to do is go back to the uh, early 1700s when Britain was in charge of pretty much the entire world and they were starting to send beer to the colonies in uh, India as well as Australia. So from London, they would, the ships would come down and hit the Canary Islands, the Cape Verde Islands, and then head westward almost to the tip of Brazil. And from there they would catch the winds that would take them around the Cape of Good Hope and then up to uh, Mumbai or Bombay, where they would deliver beer. <clears throat> this voyage took about four to six months, and it was often the case that the beer would spoil en route. <clears throat> so in order to make the beer last longer, they would add more hops to the beer back where it was being brewed in London, and hops actually acts as a natural preservative. <clears throat> Some ships then would return to London, but others would then go on and go uh, to uh, Australia, and in particular Sydney, and this is in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Ships would carry enough beer for the sailors to drink on the way there, and enough beer for the sailors to drink on the way back. <clears throat> so that was the minimum amount of beer that these ships would carry. And again, as I said earlier, uh, you drank the water, you got sick and died. You drank the beer and you were fine. And they didn't understand why, but they just knew that's how it worked. <clears throat> so as a sailor, one of the provisions had to be beer. Some of the more adventurous sailors then would go on to Australia. Again, there had to be enough beer to take them to Australia and enough beer to get them back to India and then back eventually to um, the UK or London. One of the common uh, misconceptions about the name IPA is the India part, well, it's because the beer was going to India. So they called it an India Pale Ale. <clears throat> Actually, if you look deeper into historical records, the first time the term India Pale Ale appeared was actually in Australia. <clears throat> so this is in the, this is 1828, and they're talking about an East India Pale Ale. <clears throat> and that's really significant because the company that was transporting the beer from the UK to India and then onward to Australia was called uh, the East India Company. So the IPA that you're drinking or will be drinking, the name does not come from the country of India, but rather it comes from the company that used to transport the beer. So a lot of people, again, think it's, well, it's India because the beer was going to India, but that's not the case. So we're going to try two different IPAs. One is called the West Coast IPA. Actually, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. <clears throat> Let me just, <clears throat> we find that IPAs can take on monikers based on geography. So here are some common IPAs. <clears throat> and then we can also call IPAs according to whatever ingredients they have in them. So. Again, double or imperial, if you see that, you know that there's a lot of alcohol in it, and it's more than 7.5%. <clears throat> so we're going to try two different IPAs. 
The West Coast IPA we're going to try. Typically, a West Coast IPA, um, it's, it's going to be um, hop forward. You're going to taste the piney, piney or resin or earthiness to it. <clears throat> And then the other one is a relatively new style, and that's a New England IPA. And, and if you've heard of a hazy IPA or a cloudy IPA, all right, that's typically done by brewers who will add stuff like wheat flour or oat flour to give it the haziness that you find in there. And the best way of describing a New England IPA is it's, it's juicy. And the two samples that Mitch has picked out for us tonight are very good examples of these two particular styles. <clears throat> 